Good evening, everyone. My name is John Moser. I am professor of history and co-chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program here at Ashland University. Welcome to Documents in Detail. This is teachingamericanhistory.org's new webinar series. In each episode, we'll do a deep dive into a single document discussing the historical, literary, and rhetorical aspects of it, while also analyzing its impact on American history, people, and thought. TeachingAmericanHistory.org is a project of the Ashbrook Center, a nonpartisan nonprofit based at Ashland University. We provide a variety of programs and resources for teachers of American history, government, and civics, all based on primary documents. In the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to an archived video and audio from today's program. To help us begin to think about the topics of, these, of this year's webinars, we are drawing speeches, letters, and writings from the Ashbrook Center's extensive document database available at tah.org. You can participate in the discussion by typing your questions into the chat window at the bottom of your screen at any time. We will do our best to get to every question. The subject of today's program is Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham City Jail. And to help discuss it, we have with us Professor Lucas Morell of Washington and Lee University and Professor Peter Myers of the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire. Both, I might add, are members of the faculty of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program at Ashland University. So let's get, just jump right into this document. This is probably one of the most frequently assigned documents at the high school and the college level, uh, certainly in 20th century American history. Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the reason for its enduring importance and appeal? No. Throw that to whoever would like to take it up. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with something uh, easy. It's uh, probably the most thoughtful and rigorously argued defense of the concept of civil disobedience, uh, certainly in the 20th century, arguably uh, in American history. Um, uh, I think the only uh, other famous or, or perhaps more famous uh, civil disobedience uh, advocate would be Thoreau, but I think uh, given at uh, what the length is, uh, Pete will check me on this, I think it's about 7,000 words. Um, when King responded to uh, basically a page ad or announcement in uh, a Birmingham newspaper explaining why they shouldn't be having those protests and demonstrations, especially in, uh, in defiance of a court order, uh, King took the time with a few editors and friends to pen a more than one page response. And given how many uh, elements are articulated in here and uh, the various um, sources he cites, uh, King shows off his range both theologically and philosophically in this essay that I, I can't think of anything uh, that does a better job of making the case uh, for dis uh, civil disobedience than uh, what King does in this uh, essay, certainly his most famous essay. Yeah, let me let me add to that a little bit. Um, I guess in, in in the bigger scope of things, you know, you, you, John, you're asking why why is this so important? Um, King thought of the, the the civil rights movement as the Third American Revolution, um, as a, as a, as a great revolution of. I, you know, I'm I'm about to say our day, but that that marks me as being old. Uh, but uh, but the great revolution of our time, and I think that's the way it has gone down in history. So there's that. Um, you focus specifically on Birmingham, and you can make the case that the the Birmingham campaign is really the great turning point of the of the civil rights movement. Yeah, you know, the. Um, not that there was nothing before, and not that there, of course, was simply failure before, but there's a period in which the movement is getting a little stagnant and King is actually despairing of its prospects. Uh, and the Birmingham campaign itself was uh, starting to run aground a bit. And, uh, and then fortunes turned around. We can get into that later. There's no need to try to tell the whole story right now. But uh, but the the letter from a Birmingham jail is kind of the key manifesto that comes out of that at the key moment of the of the of the civil rights movement. Uh, 
which in a certain sense is the key moment of, uh, of domestic development, or at least one of them in, uh, in 20th century America. So that's, a, that's one way of encapsulating its importance. Hmm. Okay. Well, we, we don't have any uh, questions right off the bat, so I, I think this would be a perfect time uh, to go a little bit more into the context of this. Peter, you say that, that in many ways the, the, it seemed like the, 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 the fate of the, uh, the, the tide of the civil rights movement was at something of a low ebb at this point. Uh, could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, there'd been a, well, there's, well, okay, if we go back to Montgomery for a moment, right, you know, and the, the moment that everyone knows about when Rosa Parks decides that she's not going to, uh, she's not going to, not going to sit in the back of the bus and, uh, uh, and the Montgomery movement starts. The Montgomery movement is a great success, but a qualified success. It establishes King as kind of a national figure. Um, its objectives weren't tremendously grand. It was a, it was a success. It's followed up by, uh, you know, by sit-ins in 1960, which King had nothing to do with, really, except to, except to praise them from afar. But King himself goes on this campaign in, uh, in Albany, Georgia, to try to desegregate, and he wants to practice um, civil disobedience and fill the jails, and he's, and he's somewhat dependent upon the immoderation, uh, to put it politely, of... Uh, of the, the 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 sheriffs and so forth who would be charged with enforcing the law, he's depending on them to commit acts of brutality that he can publicize and uh, and and carry public opinion in his favor. And in Albany, that doesn't happen. He gets kind of outsmarted by the by the sheriff there, and uh, and and so he retreats from Albany. And the the consensus, the media consensus, is that that's that's really a failure. Um, in Birmingham. It was kind of a, so on to 1963, Birmingham has a reputation of being the, in a way, the, what does King call it, the, the I, I can't remember his words, but it's essentially the, you know, ground zero, the center of, uh, of segregation and white supremacy in the United States. And so the idea is if they can crack segregation in Birmingham, they can do it anywhere. And the... Uh, the the movement got off to a somewhat slow start. The jails are starting to fill, but they didn't have any bail money, and they're not really making any any advances, uh, and they weren't quite sure where to turn. It's not that the letter turned these things around, um, but the 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 decision to use children in the campaign uh, turned things around. It got the reporters back in back in town. Got the publicity flowing. King decides to go to jail. And uh, and then uh, and then takes the opportunity to write this to write this letter. I'm, I've talked for a long time, Lucas. You probably want to get in on something. Well, there. you're leaving me the best bit, which uh, they had a great a uh, opponent from Central Casting yeah. in uh, the the uh, the commissioner of public safety, of course, <laughs> uh, Theophilus Bull Eugene uh, Eugene Theophilus Bull Connor. And Theophilus, of course, for those of you who know Greek, means lover of God. Uh, at any rate, uh, Bull Connor uh, was not as wily as uh, Sheriff Pritchett in Albany. Sheriff Pritchett was smart enough to, he had actually read King's works, his, his books, with few books he had published by then, and said, fine, he wants publicity, he won't get it. Instead of shoving all uh, the protesters into the same jail and, and reacting um, with brute force against them, I'll distribute them throughout the county. And he was just, uh, King was outsmarted. Uh, Connor was not going to have any of that. Connor was going to uh, keep King and uh, his protesters under his thumb. Uh, and uh, he, he pretty much uh, brought this one to King on a, on a plate. Hmm. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a question here, if I'll paraphrase a little bit. What was the motivation? Uh, obviously, the letter is in response to, uh, the, to the, the concerns of clergymen publicly expressed. But what was the immediate cause for uh, for the clergyman to write this uh, to, to to make this appeal? I've I've just been I've been reading about this. This is a very interesting story. Um, the let, let me say a word first about the idea that the letter is in response to the clergy. In a in a certain sense, it is. And King uh, 
King plays that up in an interesting way. Um, I'm going to talk too long if I get into that. So, so bring me back to that uh, at a certain point if we if we have time. But um, the they were looking for an opportunity. the The consensus was among King and SCLC leadership, Southern Christian Leadership Conference leadership, that they needed a document. They needed something like a manifesto. Uh, and so they were looking for an opportunity. King King liked to personate St. Paul for obvious reasons. He indicates that in, uh, in, this, in this letter itself. Um, and so the opportunity to write a letter from a jail was something they'd actually been kicking around for a while. They were looking for, looking for a moment. And then this letter from these, these eight clergy so to speak, fell into their laps uh, while King was while King was in jail, and so the letter gets kind of the letter from the clergy gets hustled to him, and uh, and then he decides to and then he he composes this this response, but it's interesting that one of the interesting things is that this letter which King. Um, you know, he uses fairly personal language. He, he addresses them in the second person. You know, you've said this about me. Here's my response. Um, that letter was was never delivered to uh, to those clergy in in any personal way. Um, and King, at a certain point in the letter from a Birmingham jail, um, King says he looks forward to a time when he could sit down with them face to face and talk this out as Christian brothers. And that never happened. King was King was never interested in doing that. the The letter really, in a certain sense, is not addressed to the eight clergy. The letter is addressed. Uh, I'm being a little flippant, but the letter is addressed to the New York Times. I mean, the, the the letter the letter is an attempt to gain national publicity for the cause, and the ministers are cast in a role that in a certain sense they had put themselves in and in a certain sense they really were unwilling participants they were they were stage props for what uh, for what king wanted to do here okay very interesting lucas you have any more to add on that uh no uh, uh, well actually i'm going to say no and then just think of something <laughs> to add of course since i'm here um i would just say that uh, the unwilling prop part uh, i think is right and and, and it, it some respects unfortunate um, uh, because uh, all of the eight uh, white clergymen, there was one rabbi, one Catholic, the rest Protestant, um, they were all to some extent or another um, what King would refer to as white moderates. In other words, these were not rabid segregationists. Um, the, the two older ones, no surprise, uh, uh, happen to be the ones who are a little, are, are more on the go slow side. The others are go slow, but not that slow. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, the unfortunate thing is that although he does kind of cabin his criticisms uh, to, to, to various charges in uh, the lengthy response, uh, all of these clergymen uh, are living in a place where they have to, in some respects, answer to their congregations uh, and in other respects um, have to take care of their own responsibilities and jobs. And, and all of them, as I say, to one extent or another, are, are believe that segregation is wrong. Uh, the question is um, how to go about desegregating. Um, and of course, they think what King is doing is uh, um, much too, as they say, extreme. Uh, we can get into the charges that he responds to uh, uh, in the letter that, you know, King's an outsider, uh, he's an extremist. Uh, uh, he's even if he's peaceful, he's provoking tension, and therefore he's responsible for the tension and even violence that occurs. Uh, and so it's more a question of tactics. And the other thing that we haven't mentioned yet is that um, this demonstration that they were planning for Easter weekend, which is the set, second busiest shopping day of the year, um, is taking place soon after an election had taken place where the uh, so-called moderate segregationist, a guy named Boutwell, had actually won and won by a margin where the black vote was actually critical. Um, in Birmingham, blacks actually were registered and could vote. Uh, and therefore, uh, the clergymen were uh, banking on a very old, traditional American way of doing justice, which is uh, the law and the courts. If you think something is wrong, then you, you, you uh, take it through the courts. Uh, if the laws are bad, you try to shape uh, public opinion so that the laws will be shaped. Uh, and of course, it was bull 
Connor who lost in that election. It was a contested election because they were actually changing the form of, of government, uh, mayor and, and council, the way they relate to one another. Uh, so that was still being uh, contested. They were actually meeting at, at separate times. On, in some cases, on the very same day, there were two different governments uh, that claimed to be the actual government of Birmingham. Uh, but, but that said, um, uh, Boutwell was the moderate. And Boutwell, along with uh, even local black uh, businessmen and black clergy, not all of them, but some black clergy were saying, look, let's handle this uh, a peaceful way. Negoti let's negotiate. We'll operate in good faith. Uh, King really is he, uh, working with the local guy, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who is no namby-pamby of, of a personality. Uh, this guy's a, a fire breather. And they said, look, Let's handle this uh, amongst ourselves. No need to bring in all this attention from outside. Uh, and of course, uh, 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 King's response to that and says, "No, we're going to we're going to make this uh, uh, our, our, our cause celeb." This question of proceeding via legal means uh, it, it 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 calls to mind um, Lincoln's Lyceum speech. And, yes. uh, and 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 it it seems to be completely the opposite message, right? Lincoln Lincoln points out that, uh, or says that that we are we, we have to swear on the blood of the revolution that uh, that that we obey the law even in its tiniest degree because to do otherwise uh, undermines the whole concept of law. Uh, if if we were to imagine a, a wholly ahistorical conversation between Lincoln and King, do you suppose Lincoln would take the reverend to task? Yes, uh, I'll let. But I, I talk last. I'll let Pete take that one first. <laughs> I'm tempted to say, you know, ask me that again in two months because I'm uh, I'm uh, one of my one of my heritage tasks is to write an essay on exactly that subject, which wow. I'm just <laughs> which I'm just now gathering ideas about. Trial run, and trial run. I, I'm inclined to I'm inclined to agree with Lucas, um, you know, qualifiedly. I think. Um, would uh, would Lincoln have taken King to cat to task over the civil disobedience idea? I, to an extent, I think yes. In in Lincoln's letter, sorry, in Lincoln's uh, in Lincoln's Lyceum speech, there's a there's a little bit of an out. I mean, in the sense that uh, you know Lincoln says reverence for the laws and so forth, obedience for the law, um, but there is a bit of a qualification unless it's just just simply intolerable, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so with that, then there's a matter of prudential judgment of circumstances about about just how intolerable. And King King is eloquent on that point in the letter, you know, and saying, look, we've waited a very long time and there's this big, long, it's a single sentence, this long, long sentence mm -hmm. with all these clauses that begin, when you have experienced this, when you have experienced this, and he goes on and on about that. So there's a there's an eloquent case that this is one of those exceptional moments. So so there may be a ground of of partial agreement there between Lincoln and King. That said, um, I think um, I think Lincoln would want from King a much more precise explanation of just exactly why these are exceptional circumstances uh, and why civil disobedience cannot be justified simply by saying my conscience tells me it's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, uh, <laughs> to quote Lincoln's phrase, that, or to, to adopt Lincoln in a way, that, that is, I think Lincoln would say, the essence of anarchy. Um, yeah, ahead, and Lucas. I can add um, to King's credit, he acknowledges that this is the most vulnerable aspect of his uh, argument for civil disobedience. Uh, this is a letter that he publishes in 1963, uh, which has already been pointed out. It's about nine years after the Brown v. Board of Education decision. Uh, I think we talked about Brown earlier. Was it maybe just the, the Montgomery bus boycott? But in either case, uh, both the desegregation of schools, K through 12 in the United States, as well as uh, the desegregation of public transportation in Montgomery, both of those came to a fitting uh, conclusion as a result of a court order, uh, the law and order uh, process. And, and what was frustrating, of course, is when Brown v. Board came down on May 17, 1954, you had what was known as uh, massive resistance. In other words, not just individual citizens, 
but public officials saying, over our dead bodies, we're not going to comply. And in fact, right, the most famous case, or well, one of the most famous cases, Central High, Little Rock, Arkansas, the high school there, it was three years uh, before they complied with Brown. And it took uh, the nationalization of the state militia by uh, President Eisenhower sending in the 101st Airborne as well uh, to uh, escort the Little Rock Nine uh, to school. And so King recognized that uh, if he's telling people, well, yeah, we want to obey all the good laws, but we get to decide which laws aren't good and you don't get to disobey those. What about the people who wanted to disobey Brown because they thought it was bad law? It was uh, uh, not a very constitutionally, uh, it wasn't argued well on the basis of the Constitution. So to, to cite King, he says, you express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. This is his first response to Lincoln. <clears throat> Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954, outlawing segregation, it's rather strange and paradoxical to find us consciously breaking laws. One may well ask, I don't know, Lincoln, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? So uh, the good rhetorician that King was, uh, he actually thinks of an argument against the one that he's making and I think this is the most vulnerable point uh, uh, of his letter. And to his credit, he brings it up himself. He doesn't wait for someone to say, but wait a second, you get to break the laws, but the segregationists don't? Yeah, can, I, can I add to that a bit? Um, sure. No! We, <laughs> we've, well, we've, you know, John has, has, uh, has expertly staged this as a debate between King and, uh, and, and Lincoln, which is, uh, which is a heavyweight bout, right? Um, yep. But uh, King had had a little bit of practice in this. King didn't have to read. I don't know whether or not he ever read uh, uh, Lincoln's Lyceum speech. He did. He 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 was something of a devotee of Lincoln. But uh, King had debated James J. Kilpatrick um, in 1960 on the subject of civil disobedience. That was in the context of the of the sit-ins. And, uh, and King was, of course, defending the principle then with much the same arguments, really, that he makes in the letter from a Birmingham jail. And Kilpatrick was, um, uh, Kilpatrick, may, you know, what everyone thinks of his motives or, or, him, or him personally, Kilpatrick wasn't stupid. And he, he made a strong case against King on more or less the grounds that Lucas was uh, the, the Lucas was describing a minute ago that, well, okay, we believe those court rulings are wrong conscientiously, you know, and so, you know, what if we conscientiously resist also? Then I think that that really reduces King to the, um, to the alternative just of saying, well, we're, we're right about justice and you're wrong, <laughs> and, and uh, which is, you know, which is not an indefensible position, but, um, uh, I, I've forgotten where I read this, but there was an account in the aftermath that apparently Ella Baker was really mad at King after that debate with Kilpatrick because she thought that he had that Kilpatrick had gotten the better of him and that King hadn't prepared adequately for for defense against the proposition that there could be such a thing as a conscientious segregationist uh, who who honestly believes that God's law, that the U.S. constitutional law is in fact on their side. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I have a uh, this question here, a little bit uh, broader one. Uh, why do you think is the it, was the civil rights movement more successful after World War II? I mean, what did the war have to do with energizing the civil rights movement? I'll throw in two cents about that. Uh, King uh, uh, King addresses that in some early sermons in uh, in the, in the. 1950s, um, and he he's describing why it's sort of on the theme. You get a little bit of it in the letter that now is now is the time that uh, that Black Americans have decided, not because King has talked him into it. King thinks that he's kind of riding a wave. Now is the time for uh, for uh, a civil Black uprising, and he thinks that not the only cause, but some big part of the cause is World War II for one very practical reason uh, and also one really grandly theoretical reason. 
which uh, the practical reason is something that's familiar in American history. The black Americans, of course, had served in the U.S. military in World War II uh, and, uh, and at great peril to themselves, of course, and then are coming home to a segregated America in which their rights are disrespected. And, it's, and of course, that's quite hard to justify. Second, second thing, the larger point is that, you know, the United States has confronted white supremacy in a way, you know, in, in World War II in, the, in the, the ugliest and most tyrannical form it had ever appeared in world history. But it's white supremacy bearing a principled similarity you know, not in, in principle, not in, not in magnitude, with the regime that prevails in much of the United States. Um, that, that, that would force a rethinking of segregation on the part of a lot of people who hadn't really given it a whole lot of thought before. Yeah, I, I was, when, when we, when we uh, discuss this, I always like to tell my students that, look, World War II obviously didn't end racism, but it really did kick the intellectual supports out from under it. Uh, Lucas, would you care to uh, to add anything to that? Um, just briefly, uh, as Pete mentioned in earlier sermons and even essays, King talks about, and just to use the locution of, of the era, he talked about uh, um, what people at the time referred to as the new Negro. In other words, that there was this sense in the mid-20th century of a new self-respect, uh, a new uh, sense of dignity on the part of blacks, um, that they weren't going to take it anymore, as it were. And uh, when I teach this subject, I just taught it last fall. Um, the title of my class is Black American Politics. And we go through the basically the greatest, greatest hits in terms of uh, black social and political activists. Um, we, we find that uh, when, I, when I look at the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, I almost always refer to it as the modern civil rights movement because the civil rights movement, of course, if you could say it's been, been in a kind of nation, um, as long as the nation's been al uh, alive and around, uh, this movement's been around, this struggle's been around blacks before segre uh, segregation occurred. In other words, when it was slavery, uh, we're trying uh, with uh, well-meaning whites to try to get the nation's practices to live up to its principles. So what happens around um, uh, World War I and World War II, because blacks fought in World War I as well, uh, that, that blacks uh, started to uh, say that, you know, enough is enough. This nation does need to live up to uh, its professions. Uh, as King puts it uh, so, so well later, he says, we're, all we're asking is that, uh, is that you, you, you live up to what you put down on paper. We would have an entirely different conversation if, if Americans, white Americans didn't think that their rights were based on their humanity, but based on their race. Uh, a certain, there was a certain time when a few whites actually tried to do it that way. That was called the Confederate States of America, uh, where it was explicit that white supremacy was one of the things they were trying to establish and, uh, in, in perpetuity by becoming a separate nation as a result of secession. Uh, and so uh, what we have in the 19th century, especially after wars where blacks had fought in them, uh, was a, a more public assertion of uh, the dignity and self-respect of blacks uh, and uh, especially those who had served and some very uh, nasty and public things that occurred. Uh, one black veteran had his eyes put out um, uh, because he, sh he was uh, coming home on a bus in his uniform. Uh, and uh, this was known as the uppity uh, black, I'm being very polite. Um, and whites, especially in the South, uh, didn't want that. They didn't want the fact that these guys uh, were coming back in some cases armed uh, asserting what uh, the United States Constitution and most laws said that they um, had a right to, which was uh, equality. And so, um, yeah, especially in the 40s and 50s, uh, you start seeing uh, a, a kind of um, some momentum building uh, uh, among blacks, uh, both North and South. Uh, in the North, there were riots in the 40s as a result of protests by by. Uh, middle class, polite, proper uh, black citizens on behalf of their rights. Uh, and that just was a ball that got rolling, um, you know, long before King actually became famous for uh, rehabilitating, if you were, uh, mass mobilization uh, uh, protests. It, it's funny that you mentioned the term the new Negro, because that was in vogue in the, in the 1920s as well. Yes. Yeah, it's, culturally in particular. 
Yeah, right. And 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 and, and then it, it's a phenomenon. It, it it sort of dies out in the '30s, um, but then of course comes roaring back with the with the war. Now, I, you know, I know that uh, 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 professors Morell and Myers are familiar with the uh, the Rupert Trimmingham letters to uh, to Yank Magazine, but some of our participants might be interested in it. This is going to be uh, these letters are going to be included in a volume that we're putting out on uh, a document collection of the Second World War. But uh, Rupert Trimmingham writes in 1940, 1944, I believe it was, uh, a black soldier, he and a group of other black soldiers were going across the country by rail. They had to stop. I don't quite remember where this was, somewhere in the south. And uh, they weren't allowed to eat in the railroad station diner. They were asked to go around to the back where they were fed you know, out by the garbage cans. As, they look, as they're eating, they look in the window, and who do they see sitting down to eat? A group of, uh, of of German POWs or who are able to sit inside the diner and eat while these black American soldiers have to stay outside. Uh, so it, 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 the letter itself is is is, is shocking. Um, but then he mentions at the end, well, I'm betting you know uh, 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 my friends don't think you'll print this letter. Or I I don't think it will, I don't think my uh, you'll print this letter, but my friends think that you will. <laughs> well, sure enough, not do they print the letter. But they print the follow-up where Trimingham says, ever since that's that, that letter appeared, I've been deluged by letters of support from people. So there's sort of an interesting glass half empty, glass half full uh, uh, message that comes from, from these. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so uh, we got a few questions that have, uh, have built up here. Um, I've heard that the New York Times received this letter, that is the letter, for, letter from Birmingham City Jail, uh, but chose not to publish it. Is that correct? Uh, yes, um, unless you've looked at this more recently than I, Pete, or, or did you want to jump in first? You go ahead. I'm looking up something. All right, so Pete will correct me. So let me let me do the first draft, and Pete will be my editor. Uh, yes, it was sent to the New York Times. It was scheduled to be published, and somehow, oh. and King was mad when he found out about this. Somehow, a copy got to the New York Post, mm. and it was a, yeah. they started printing excerpts ahead of the Times. And if you know if you know anything about the Times. They want exclusives, and you know that's a proper way to go about it. So as soon as the Post started printing these out, so uh, 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 without permission, by the way, from the SCLC or King, they printed excerpts of an early draft of uh, the letter from Birmingham Jail. The New York Times then just scotched the whole thing and said, "No, we're not going to we're not going to print it." But the first publication was actually a pamphlet by a Quaker society. I don't I can look up the name, but it was uh, some Quakers. Uh, who got the first version of it uh, that they disseminated um, uh, of it. And then over at the time, certain magazines like The New Leader and a, a few other Christian uh, magazines, uh, like-minded folks uh, with King uh, published it. But yeah, the original idea was to, uh, to have it printed in The New York Times. Yeah, that's right, and and uh, yeah, yeah, all of that squares with uh, with with what I have on it too. I would I would only add to that. There's a couple interesting details. The the New York Times had been involved uh, for a while in the idea that there was going to be such a such a letter in the in the Albany campaign. Um, a reporter from the Times solicited because King spent some time in jail in Albany also in Lloyd Bridges jail. And a New York Times reporter had then solicited King to write a, a prison letter, uh, a prison epistle. And uh, he didn't do it, and it isn't quite clear why. And as you get into the Birmingham campaign, the, the New York Times published a report that unidentified individuals in Birmingham were drawing up a response to the uh, the ministers, the, the letter from the eight clergy. And so uh, the, the, what that suggests is that it, it wasn't simply King's idea to do this. It was, uh, it was something that the SCLC had been, uh, had been stewing on for a while and looking for, and looking for the opportunity. Um, if I could add a further thing, that, that brings me back to a thing I was gonna I was gonna say a little while ago about the nature of that opportunity. It's it's kind of a striking thing the way that the way that King opens the letter. He says something that that you know is obviously true when you think about what life was like for him uh, by the time 1963 came around. 
when King says that, you know, I get lots and lots of mail, and <laughs> most of it is pretty critical. And if I tried to respond to everything that was written to me or about me, I wouldn't be doing anything else except except responding. So the point is that, you know, he says, I mean, in his exact words, seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas, which suggests that something about this is special, right? That, you know, of all the things that he could respond to and didn't, this one, so to speak, comes by his desk, comes across his bench in a prison cell, uh, and he thinks this one, this one needs a response. And I think the explanation is partly what we've already said, that, uh, that they're looking for an opportunity and Birmingham is a crucial campaign and we need publicity and this is going to be a good vehicle to obtain it. All of that is, is perfectly true. But I think on another level, there, it's, it's also true to say that the, the letter from the eight clergy is a, really is a perfect opportunity because of its substance and its origin. Um, because the the authors of that letter are not hardcore segregationists. You know, the authors of that letter are moderates. And so King takes this as an opportunity to extend a certain kind of reflection on the nature of moderation, Southern white moderation and, and moderation more simply, and, uh, and, uh, and his own claim to moderation you know, in, in response to the charge that he's an extremist. And that becomes a, that becomes a really big theme of the letter. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, there's more to add about those clergy, but I'll, I'll stop there for now. Okay. We've got a few more questions coming in. Uh, King mentions in a derogatory manner Elijah Muhammad and black nationalism. Can you comment on the evolution of King's thought toward people like Malcolm X? Uh, I'm not sure what uh, what that question means by evolution. Um, it's especially because uh, certainly while Malcolm X was the chief spokesman of the Nation of Islam, um, he was a uh, not only a black nationalist, but by black nationalism meaning a, a black separatist. Um, he was not anywhere remotely interested in King's uh, end game, which was what he called the beloved community not a community of tolerance, uh, a community of uh, an integrated community, a community where people loved one another. Um, he believed uh, as a pastor, no surprise, that God created people for community and that uh, of one blood, he made all men. So it didn't matter, you know, your race didn't matter. Whereas the Nation of Islam was preaching uh, black separatism, black you know, education, uh, their own religion, their own language, uh, their own schools, and so at least culturally speaking, religiously speaking, politically speaking, uh, not just the tactics, but the, not just the means, but the end uh, uh, were, were uh, radically different from what King was, uh, was aiming for. Now that was when Malcolm was still the, the principal spokesman of the Nation of Islam. That was true up until, uh, through certainly Birmingham, through the I Have a Dream speech, March on Washington of August, it was through until Kennedy's assassination in November of 63, uh, at which point, of course, as, we, as most of us should know by now, uh, Malcolm made a mistake. Uh, and the mistake was he was told, along with all the other spokesmen, that, that they were not to respond to any questions with regards to what does the Nation of Islam think about Kennedy's assassination. And the reason for that is uh, uh, blacks uh, had come uh, uh, to see Kennedy as, as their political savior, as it were, uh, political savior, uh, not social. Uh, in other words, they, they were still on board with, with King and with Thurgood Marshall and NAACP, et cetera. Uh, but they thought that here was a president, at least, who had reached out to King, to Coretta, when King was uh, incommunicado in solitary confinement. Here was finally a president who seemed to take seriously the claims of uh, equality for black people. And of course, in 63, uh, there was a civil rights bill, at least, uh, being debated, filibustered in, in Congress. So Elijah Muhammad said, don't answer anything about Kennedy. Uh, blacks love Kennedy. Uh, don't say anything. Well, what happens? Of course, uh, Malcolm X gives a speech. Uh, 
and the press harasses him. Uh, I mean, they, they badger him, asking him, asking him, asking him, what do you think about Kennedy's death? What do you think about Kennedy's death? And he finally says, well, it's a case of the chickens coming home to roost. In other words, because he is the, the principal purveyor of, of, of violence overseas in Vietnam and elsewhere, it's just coming back uh, to get him. At which point, Elijah Muhammad slaps him with a 90-day uh, uh, cease and to, to desist. He's, he's not supposed to say anything at all. No speeches, no comments, and then it becomes indefinite. So by early 64, of course, Malcolm X knows um, I'm just being written out of this organization. I got to do my own thing. So long winded, long way to say, um, I need to have a little more information about that question to see uh, what exactly uh, the overlap, uh, the, the claim of overlap is going to be given that for most of his uh, most public uh, life, uh, Malcolm X was uh, against both the end and the means of King. Um, King does uh, start borrowing some of the rhetoric, or at least the nomenclature of, of the Nation of Islam in terms of this phrase, black militancy. Um, it wasn't just pressure from Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam, it was pressure from Stokely Carmichael and the more, as we'll say from our, from our vantage point, the more radicalized version of uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, around 64, 65, they become, uh, this is a much younger set of political activists, and they think that, that King actually is a moderate. He's no extremist. He needs to be more radical. Uh, these are, if you will, the godchildren of Malcolm X's uh, definitely more uh, strident rhetoric. And so King somewhat starts adopting uh, the language of, of militancy and what it need, means to be, um, uh, what, what true black power is. And so on, as I think in a very uh, kind of superficial level, there it might be some affinity there. But in terms of principle, and I'll let Pete weigh in now, uh, I'm not sure uh, of all the affinities between them, uh, certainly not through 63. Okay. No, that's, yeah, what you got into after that is what I, or in the, the last part of your remarks is what I was going to say also. In, in 1963, uh, you know, as, as in direct relevance to the, the, the letter we're talking about, uh, King and Malcolm X are really, are really just at odds with one another. Malcolm X is very derisive. Uh, about the, both the ends and the means of the Birmingham campaign. Uh, he calls King and Uncle Tom, uh, and uh, he, he, he derides King's revolution as the, as the Negro revolution, which, which, is to, which is sort of to say the same thing in different, in different language. Um, there, there is a movement uh, on the part of both of them, so that Malcolm's nationalism uh, nearer the end of his life, 1964-65, is not really separatist anymore. Right. And King gets pushed in the radical direction in exactly the way Lucas was saying by the black power guys, by the radicalization of SNCC, by Stokely Carmichael. Um, and so, I mean, King is fearing his own irrelevance in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a certain sense, what, what King did to Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP is functionally similar to what <laughs> Stokely Carmichael and SNCC did to him. Uh, that is that, you know, they regarded, they started regarding him as kind of old and tired and irrelevant and feckless. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, so they wanted him to radicalize and he's, and he's fearing you know the the loss of his influence, which means I don't mean that in a self-interested sense. He's fearing that the cause of nonviolence is uh, is in grave peril unless he can keep this um, this fractious wing of the movement uh, under his under his influence. And so he tries to um, you know, he tries to show how the, the the rhetoric of black nationalism can be put in the service of his understanding. Of, of integration, uh, so he does. He moves in this direction, especially post 1965. Mm -hmm. But um, but there's never a point really where King and Malcolm X are simply on the are simply on the same page with regard to means and ends. Okay. Uh, another question uh, a viewer asks: Can you touch on more of the religious aspect surrounding the letter? I'll say a couple things. Lucas can give a better answer to that question, I think, than I can. Um, 
the that's one of the opportunities that the letter the the minister's letter the clergy letter supplies to him i think the 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 two things about that letter that make it really opportune for king to respond to are one its claim to moderation as mentioned before two the fact that it comes from a group the big majority of whom are Christian ministers, one Catholic priest, the rest of them Protestants, and then the eighth, uh, the, the eighth the rabbi. And so King is, is asked, King uses this as a vehicle to express um, his grave disappointment with the character of the, of the churches that Southern whites go to. You know, he's, he says at a certain point in the letter, he's driving through the south one day. I forgot what state he was in, and he's wondering to himself what God these people worship. Uh, yeah. And he tells them, uh, you know, he describes the movement as a colony of heaven, and he describes himself in terms of, uh, of, of old Hebrew prophets, but also, of course, in terms of, uh, of St. Paul as somebody in the most dangerous way, you know, like the early primitive Christians, carrying the message to the pagans um, uh, at very great peril and, uh, and ultimately succeeding. And so he's, he's scolding these ministers in a way, by the way, that they found really deeply hurtful and unjust. We can get to that in a, in a minute, but um, he's scolding these ministers for being unable to recognize the real imitators of Christ in their in their midst, you know, the the people who really are putting their lives on the line in the service of a moral principle, in the service of what they understood to be God's law, and it, and at a certain level, the the eight clergy agreed with them on that point. Um, and so King is saying, why will you not join me? You know, why are you not in the streets doing this? Look, I mean, yes, I understand it's a heavy cross for you to bear, but in the imitation of Jesus, you got to bear it. You know, it's a heavy cross for all of us to bear, too. And, uh, and so that's uh, that, that when, he, when he turns in this letter, you know, half the, half the letter, about the first half of the letter is responses to charges. Uh, uh, that the ministers put to him, the clergy put to him. And, and the second half, um, he says, he begins by saying, I have to make a couple honest confessions, but his confessional is really uh, the, the beginning of accusations. And he, and he says, I'm, you know, I'm expressing my grave disappointment in you. And then he goes on in the spirit in which I've just described. Yeah, I think that's uh, really well put, uh, Pete. Um, uh, let me just have us uh, take a helicopter and land in a few spots where we can see how how effective uh, King's use of of uh, these Christian and Jewish rhetorical touch points are uh, in this essay. I mean, he he he. Yes, the the true audience is a national audience, a majority white America, to try to put pressure on them uh, to put pressure in these various communities. Uh, if these communities won't change, let's change them through federal laws. Let's change them through federal court orders. Uh, but the immediate audience of having a, a Catholic, a Jewish uh, a rabbi and a Protestant uh, pastors is, is wonderful for King because then he can show them that their own heroes, their own forebears, their own religious uh, sectarian traditions, uh, he thinks he enlists them for his uh, camp, his school of, of social and political reform rather than what he's criticizing as Pete put put it, uh, the, the white moderate church, broadly speaking, um, early, right, responding to uh, the charge of being an outsider. He points out, wasn't Paul an outsider? Uh, that's for the Christian audience. Uh, how about those Old Testament prophets? They weren't very popular in their day, and boy, some awful things happened to them <laughs> when they were human megaphones for the Lord, right? So he begins with that one as an example um, on that very vulnerable point of, you know, uh, breaking a law, for the sake of re re reforming the law and just uh, appealing to your conscience. Link, uh, he says, you know, this is a legitimate concern. Uh, would this lead to anarchy? So he goes on to quote uh, some Catholic heroes like St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. I mean, can't argue 
they don't get more Catholic <laughs> in terms of theology <laughs> and philosophy than those two guys. And then, of course, you can't leave out the Jewish man in the audience. So Martin Buber, right, uh, the famous book of the I and the Thou, right? So he's got that thrown in there. Um, but more fundamentally speaking, I mean, King says, look, um, it's embarrassing for me to see that there are community agencies that aren't Jewish or Catholic or Protestant who are the leaders in this in certain ways. When Shouldn't it be the church, as he puts it, that should be the headlight rather than the tail light? Uh, isn't our um, uh, witness, isn't our purpose uh, to, to shine a light on society and not do merely the popular thing. That's what politicians are for. Uh, let them be popular. We're here to be the, the, the conscience. We're here to, sto to stir the soul of the nation. And instead, we're lukewarm, uh, you know, shades of revelations, right? Where, where the God will spit you out of your mouth, his mouth. He wants you to be cold or hot. None of this lukewarm uh, business. And then the charge of being an extremist, right? Watch what he does here. Who does he cite? You know, first, he says, you know, when I was first, I thought I was an extremist. No, that's what Malcolm X is. I'm not an extremist. Come on. I don't think whites are incurable devils. Um, I don't, I'm not practicing this religion that is very, in King's mind, very foreign to traditional Judeo-Christian ethics in the United States. And then a page later, he goes, you know what, extremism? Hmm, that might not be a bad uh, uh, appellation to have. Wasn't Amos, right, Old Testament prophet, wasn't he an extremist? How about Paul? How about Jesus? How about Martin Luther, you Protestants? Wasn't he an extremist? How about John Bunyan, right? The, the author of the most, I think, most publicized book, Pilgrim's Progress, in, in, in for, for centuries. And he was jailed uh, for his, uh, his particular Christian views. And then he goes on and, you know, cites Jefferson and Lincoln. But uh, this, this is a, a letter that is suffused with theological uh, and uh, biblical, both Old and New Testament references. Uh, and so you, you get it coming and going uh, from King. And, he, and, it's, and it's honest because the guy uh, uh, has a seminary degree on top of a PhD. Hmm. Okay, we have a question about uh, A.G. Gaston, his uh, discontent with King coming to Birmingham. Was the, uh, was the problem, uh, sorry, a little fuzzy on this, uh, why was A.G. Gaston, I guess, opposed to uh, to King coming to Birmingham? You got that, Pete? I think I do. A.G. Gaston is the... He's the hotel guy, right? The hotel the magnet? Hotel is the hotel millionaire, right? Yeah. 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 Um, well, I think that, that A.G. Gaston stands for uh, a portion of the black community in, in Birmingham which is not happy with the nonviolent direct action. It's not happy with the street protests. Uh, they, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting bit. It's a good thing not to, uh, to overlook here, that, you know, that the story here is not just black protesters against white resistors. Um, the white community is complicated um, in regard to this issue. And in its own way, the black community is complicated in regard to the, mm -hmm. to the Birmingham campaign. So you got, you know, it's not that they're that they're friendly to segregation, and it's not that they're submissive in the way that King describes his frustration with some with some blacks uh, of his of his day, um, but they don't like disorder, uh, and and they're quite aware having to live in the local circumstances of just exactly what brutality enraged some of the enraged whites in their midst are capable of uh, if, they're, if they're stirred up. And so it's a dangerous, risky thing to stir this up. Um, is it not a better thing to sit down? In a certain sense, this is kind of a this is the this is the black version of the message that the eight clergy are trying to are trying to convey. That is it not better to sit down behind closed doors and negotiate this out um, and avoid a lot of bloodshed and a lot of animosity or intensified animosity that's gonna that's gonna prolong the issue here. I, I mm -hmm. think that's that's a a, a reasonable summation of uh, of why he was. Um, why he wasn't on board right away. Mm -hmm. 
Might might he have uh, uh, King have it, had Gaston in mind when he wrote uh, a few middle class Negroes who, because of a degree of academic and economic security, and because in some ways they profit by segregation, have become insensitive to the problems of the masses. Well, that's probably what King. Yeah, I mean, I th I think that's a, that that legitimately expresses King's view of it. I think I think Gaston would read that and find it grossly unjust as a description of. What his uh, what his real motives were, it's sort of the way that the ministers uh, that the eight clergy uh, it regarded it as unjust what uh, what King had said about them. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, just to add a further point about that, the the letter that that King is responding to, the Good Friday letter from the eight clergy, which is an appeal to law and order and common sense, is actually the second letter they had written of that title an appeal to law and order and common sense. The first one was uh, was published. It was a public letter again. It was published in January of 1963. And though he was unnamed, the person really to whom that was addressed was George Wallace. And the spirit of that letter was obey the law, meaning comply with the Brown ruling and stop resisting. And that earlier letter uses the word rebellious, um, of course, which is a way of saying to them, look, we're not still fighting the Civil War. Stop it. You know, obey the law and uh, and let's work out uh, a process of desegregation. Uh, and they and, and that came at some cost to them in their own um, uh, in their own ministry. So for King to say, I'm the one bearing the cross and you're not, you know, I'm the one taking the risks and you're not. Uh, you know, I'm bearing witness and you're not. They regarded that as quite unjust because they, some of them had their were, were out on a limb on this issue also. Okay. We have uh, only a few minutes left, but there's one question I'd really like to get to if, if I could each ask uh, each of you to answer very quickly uh, because it involves the, 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 uh, the reading by Joseph Jackson. Yeah. Uh, Jackson indicates a sense of patience in this piece, as the question goes, while King seems to reject such an idea. Was Jackson's position related to, to, the, to the time period involving you know, Vietnam or the Cold War, or was this sort of a resentment of King's approach? Oh, well, he resented King's approach uh, for reasons that he spells out pretty clearly in this speech. Uh, I should add, or I should begin by saying that uh, King and Jackson were rivals uh, in uh, the National Baptist Convention. Notice, it isn't just the Baptist Convention. Blacks had to come up with their own convention because yeah. whites were squeezing them out in, in many ways. In certain cases, they were locking the doors of churches so that blacks couldn't attend. Uh, and King eventually has to start his own convention. I think he, it, the Progressive Baptist Convention or something along those lines. So, I mean, Joseph Jackson, you got to, this guy was referred to as the Black Pope. He was the, the, he was the head of the largest black denomination, Christian denomination in the United States, and he was the head for decades. Uh, uh, and so uh, there is some sense of a rivalry there among preachers uh, in terms of the direction of uh, the, this fairly large uh, flock uh, uh, of congregants. Uh, but that said, um, the speech that, that Jackson gives um, points out a, a very fundamental principle that he thinks uh, that King uh, uh, misses, and it's the principle of, in this country, uh, the majority rules. Hmm. And so for blacks to gain anything in the way of progress, it has to be done in a way that the majority finds agreeable. Uh, uh, which means uh, that you've got to make arguments that are consistent with the principles that are at least professed, if not practiced, or practiced completely, uh, by that majority. He says this is the tried and true American way. Um, it looks from the cr critics' side as simply, you know, being the preserver of the status quo, uh, but jo Joseph Jackson thinks this is the American way. Uh, law and order is the most secure way for us to make our gains, he has the benefit, it's 64 now, so he has the benefit of not just Brown v. Board of Education in his back uh, behind him, but he has the benefit of the Civil Rights Act being passed at a time, remember, where there are no black senators, zero. And there's a handful of black representatives. So you had to get an awful lot of white people in the national legislature to agree that this thing for blacks was win-win. Sorry, Pete, I gave you like 45 seconds left. Oh, well, 
It actually, I need about a minute to, uh, to close. Oh. I'm afraid, I'm afraid Pete's out in the cold on this. Um, I want to uh, to thank both of our panelists, Lucas Morell, Pete Myers, for a terrific discussion. I would like to thank all of our participants. We didn't even get to all the questions, um, uh, but but there were some great ones out there today. Uh, just a reminder about the email you will receive with a link for uh, the certificate of participation. If you have enjoyed today's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course or a face-to-face -face graduate course through the Ashbrook Center. Uh, these are offered through our, uh, our Master of Arts in uh, American History and Government program. You can find more information about Ashbrook's online course offerings at teachingamericanhistory.org. You can help us spread the word about these programs by sharing the archive link, which you'll receive by email next week to your colleagues and share it on social media. Uh, our next Documents in Detail webinar will be March 22nd, when we'll be considering James Madison's Federalist No. 10. I will be joined then by Professor John Dynan of Wake Forest University and Professor Jason Stevens of Ashland University. The recommended readings for that webinar have already been posted. So until then, I look forward to seeing you all on March 22nd. Good night. Thanks, John. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. Good talking Thanks. to you, Lucas. Thanks, you guys.